Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast, where we interview entertainment pros about their careers and how they became successful in the industry. The secrets to their success here every week. Here's your host, Sean Ventura. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Ventura. And today we're going to talk to my good friend, Steve Henderson, who is a VO Pro guru and teacher. He's the guy that people go to when they want to get better at voiceover. I've probably known each other for 10 years working at Turner, at Turner Sports, Turner Studios. But um, for six or seven of them, we worked across the hall from each other and we went into each other's rooms every day and chatted. And, um, you know, besides Matt Price, who left, who's also going to do an interview uh, soon, uh, you're probably one of my best friends there at Turner. And we would talk about our families and just life and stuff and laugh so hard with a bunch of these other NBA.com guys and TNT guys. Um, it was it was a great time. It was one of the best times for me at Turner. I'm sorry, your name is uh, what, who are you? Just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. No, I, I totally miss you, man. And, oh, uh, you man. Know, uh, that's one of those things where, you know, you walk in each day and I still look in the room that you were in and uh, it's just weird. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I'm not there weird. anymore. Yeah, yeah, I left Turner. But, uh, so. Yeah, I, I missed those daily chats and, uh, you know, it was definitely something that made uh, work uh, something to look forward to going to. So, Yeah, it was always good to have those conversations with you and others. And I, and I say to so many people, like, you know, when you do a job... Um, the work is is fine. It's good. And sometimes it's very exciting what you do, but it's really more about the people and the relationships that you make with the people. And, um, and that's really what you miss. And I can attest to that, um, with Turner is that I miss hanging out with certain guys like you. So going to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I definitely miss those times <laughs> heading up to that. Uh, you know, when they finally put that Starbucks in there, man, that was, uh, that was a blessing and a yeah, curse. The, star, the daily Starbucks <laughs> run. When was the first time you knew you wanted to do voiceover? So the first time I wanted to do voiceover, I was very young. I'm talking maybe four or five. And the reason I knew that is because my dad used to be in cell art animation for commercials and promos and things like that. And um, I got my voice, I would say, from my dad. He and I sound pretty much exactly the same. Okay. Um and so I couldn't draw very well, <laughs> but I wanted to work for him. So uh, my idea was that I could come up with all the voices for his characters that he was drawing. Oh, so and they were like cartoons or? Yeah, they were. It was like, you know, this was back in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, everything was done on a Steenbeck editor. And, you know, it was all cell art where you're laying actual cells on top of each other mm -hmm. for depth. And, you know, he had all these little characters that he would come up with. And, you know, he's always had a fascination with... Uh, animals and the little expressions that they make. And, you know, I used to see those expressions and I used to think, well, how would that sound? And, you know, I always used to come up to him and say, I'm going to voice that character for you one day and all that kind of stuff. Right. Of course, that never, ever happened, but <laughs> <laughs> it did make me want to, uh, to give it a shot. So, um, and you know, the irony of it is I have a, a cousin who used to come over and, uh, and babysit for us. And, one of the things he would do was this Alvin and the Chipmunks voice. And I used to laugh just hysterically at that. Yeah. And the thing that I, I, I wanted to do it, I thought, my gosh, he, he, he gets smiles out of these people. He's making people laugh. And so that was actually the first voice that I ever studied how to do. Right. And uh, I would say that was prob probably my first character voice. And how old were you roughly? Were you like 10 or 20? Uh, yeah, I'd say probably 10, maybe 11. Okay. And you know how they make those voices, right? Because I didn't know for years that they just sped up the, the record player. Yeah, so you know that's what that? I figured out, and uh, eventually, yeah. But I didn't know that, and so I actually figured out how to do it uh, without having to speed myself up. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome, man. That is very cool. All right, so where do you go from there? So you're ten, and you're doing these voices, is there any kind of uh, classes that you're taking before high school or does something happen in high school or college? You know, I got, got to be honest with you. When I was in high school, my goal was to play in the NBA. And uh, that cool. very clearly did not happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, but everybody used to tell me that I had a great voice and all this kind of stuff. And um, 
you know, it was a, a kind of a smack in the mouth to realize once I finally got into the industry that the good voice was pretty much, I mean, it was good to have. Right. But it's like an instrument. It, if you don't know how to play it, it's going to sound terrible. And so I had to take the, take the initiative to uh, just start to listen to what was out there. Unfortunately, the, what I was listening to were a bunch of big announcers. You know, the guy from Price is Right, the come on down right, and all right. that kind of stuff. That's who I was studying and I didn't know any better. And so everything that I was reading was, you know, very much like this. And then it'd come down here like this and all this kind of stuff like that. And it just didn't sound real. Right. And so that was a problem. So I got a job when I was in college at an oldies radio station. And it was, I was one of five people uh, that worked at that station and a, a great guy just taught me so much. His name's Mike Beverly. He's actually going into the Tennessee Radio Hall of Fame this year. Wow, And cool. uh, congratulations to him. Yeah. But he, you know, he, he brought in this guy named Tom Miller. And Tom is one of those guys that just has this vanilla delivery, just so smooth and so just, you know, unimposing and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I want you to watch this. And this is the back in the day where they had the little pegging meters. It wasn't the digital LED readouts right. and all that kind of stuff that we have today. And he's like, I want you to watch this. And he started playing Tom's voice and the meter barely even moved. I mean, it just went to a level and it just kind of stayed there. Right. And he's like, now I want you to look at yours. <laughs> and, <laughs> and mine was all over the place. And he's like, I need your voice to do what his, to do what his uh. meter is doing. You know, and so that kind of taught me a little bit about, you know, not doing the big announcery thing. And it helped me to kind of start to realize that I just needed to sound like myself because when we speak, we speak in a relative monotone. Right. And, you know, and when you start to vary your pitch so much, that's where you start to not sound real. And that was a big learning lesson for me. Right. And that that is a great lesson. But as in uh, a person who doesn't do VO and, and I've worked with a lot of VO people being a video editor. Um, I sort of assumed that VO was like that also. I assumed that VO was like Howard Cosell and welcome to the match. And, you know, like you were saying, like that was voiceover. So did you see that trend start happening when you were high school or later where they went towards the the real voices or the normal voices, if you will? Well, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because it definitely has gone from a progression and, you know, I tell a lot of my students that I work with in VO coaching right. that, you know, we need to pay attention to where it, it was, to where it is now, and let's look at how it got there. You know, back in the day, you used to have all those variety shows, and, you know, it's like the Johnny Carsons and all that with the mm-hmm. Ed McMahons off to the side. Yes, right. you tell me what you, yes, everything like that. And <laughs> yeah. The Lawrence Welk show, you know, you'd have the guy on the side who's, and now let's talk about this product from such and such. With right. this product, you can blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. It was the big announcer. And that's what people believed because at that time, TV was the thing, man. It was just, it, that's where it was. Yeah, there and so people else. believed what they heard on TV. Well, the problem is people would go and buy those products and it wouldn't be as advertised. Right. And so the more that people heard that, the more they stopped believing, the more they started to feel more misled by that big voice. So that's where the real voice kind of movement started. You know, I look at it from this perspective. Which voice do you trust? The one that says, you know, with four easy installments of just nineteen ninety five, you can call 1-800-257-1234. Right. Or the voice that says, you know, I had a problem the other day and... um I went to the store. I was a little skeptical myself, and I found this product. It, it said it would do this. I, I didn't believe it, but I bought it, and I tried it. I couldn't believe it. It actually worked. Yeah. You know, I, I see that you have the same problem. Maybe you should try it, too. What do you think? Which voice are you going to trust? Yeah, absolutely. And the so it became one, more sure. of a give me the real story. Give me the guy who will just tell you about it as opposed to sell you yeah. about it. And that's where it all kind of came from. We were talking about high school and we were talking about how you started to uh, get into the real voiceover and, and um, sounding authentic. And, and where did you go from there? Well, you know, sounding real and all that kind of stuff was kind of an abstract concept to me. I didn't really know what that meant. And, you know, as we get further along, I can speak a little bit more about how I finally realized I just needed to get out of the way. But right out of high school... Uh, I went into college at the University of Tennessee, 
and knew I wanted to get into radio. So the first day I was there, I marched down to, you know, they had a student radio station called New Rock 90 and cool. uh, got a shift there, uh, started doing some DJing. I became the production director there and uh, realized that I needed something a little more as far as guidance. So I uh, went around to the radio stations in the Knoxville area and uh, one of my fraternity brothers, he actually was interning at this station called, called U102 and put in the good word for me. And I went over there and I met a lady named Ashley Adams. And Ashley was fantastic. Uh, she took the time to actually show me how radio production was done. Okay. This was so much better. And I'm not trying to knock the University of Tennessee and their program or anything like that. I, right. I mean, it was a great thing to go through, but she actually showed me the nuts and bolts. You know, okay. at that time we were still on an, uh, you know, an eight track reel to reel and all that kind of stuff. But we were starting to get into the digital stuff too. And I'm glad that I was there to see that because I saw the hybrid, uh, you know, just kind of way things were done. So I had an understanding of the old school and the new school. And it made going through the rest of my, uh, you know, studies at the university that much easier because okay. I kind of had a, a real world perspective on how that kind of came about. But, you know, she um, let me do my first actual uh, spot that aired. It was for Blockbuster Video, if you remember that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was kind of there. But, um, you know, then one day when I was actually at the uh, the New Rock 90 radio station, I was just kind of sitting there, you know, doing my thing. And um, this guy named uh, Doug Renfro comes in the door. And, you know, based on how things are today, you know, and the and just kind of the way the culture is, I probably should have run when he asked this question. But he, he just said, hey, anybody want to earn a quick 50 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> nice. And of course me, ah, sure, I'll do it. Yeah, no, what, no problem. And um, it turns out he was looking for somebody to voice some spots. And um, he started hiring me on a consistent basis. And it was my first couple of paid gigs. And what I was doing uh, was a series of spots called Watch and Win. Hmm. And they were contest promos that aired on this channel called Channel One. And it was broadcast into schools all over the world. Okay. And uh, now... <laughs> Now knowing what rates are and uh, you know where they are, I was giving him a, a great deal at fifty dollars a shot. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know at that time I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. And you know the one thing I will say is it started to teach me a little bit about relationships and contacts and things like that because right. through Doug and word of mouth and things like that, um, you know the the client base started to grow. Okay, and once <clears throat> once I started to see that happen, I realized that that was what was really important. You right. know, the way to market yourself was just to make sure people knew who you were and what you were doing and, and stuff like that. And, and it really kind of all started to click. Right. Let me ask you this. Cause, uh, you said eight track, I know we went digital, but I was a DJ at Emerson at the radio station and we had carts. I'm a little mm -hmm. bit older than you. I'm like five years older. Uh, did you have the carts or were the eight tracks after the carts? Uh, there was you know, similar. It's, it, so it was, when I say eight track, it was an eight track reel to reel. Uh, okay. We still had the carts. Uh, oh, okay. That's probably what you're referring to as eight track. Uh, and yeah, we definitely still had that. As is the fact, eight track a cart? Is that the same thing? The eight track is a cart. Uh, the, there was an eight track player. This reel in particular, it was kind of neat because it wasn't just a one track reel of carbon. There were actually eight individual record heads on the, uh, on the spindle. Right. And so when the thing would come over, you could actually designate a track and you could do multi-layer mixing oh. on the reel. Okay. Uh, just, you know, and so that was kind of cool. It was, it, it kind of sucked when you fat fingered the rewind button and it, you know, took off and you had to go find where you were. <laughs> but Yeah. You know, I, re I remember like you just put the cart up to a magnet and it would erase it and then you could put more yeah, songs the demagnetizer. on. Yeah, Yeah, right. But I also remember, and I don't know if this happened to you, if you were alone when you were, but I was alone at the college radio station and we would have to put on stairway to heaven because it was like eight minutes. So you could run down the hallway and go to the bathroom. <laughs> Couldn't put down any three minute songs, you know, like, yeah, right. but yeah. being a DJ uh, is fun. I, right. I, uh, I, I was a little mischievous back in that day. Yeah. So my, uh, initial three hour, uh, session got reduced to a one hour, uh, uh hour session okay. <laughs> because of some of the things that I chose to do. So. Okay. All right. Let's tone it down. Okay. Yeah. All right. So where do you go from there? You're, you're in college still? Uh, well, you know, when I, when I was in college, 
um, I was working at the oldies radio station. Uh, it was uh, called West 105. A uh, wonderful lady named Debbie Greenwood uh, was the owner of that station. And uh, she and the general manager, Mike Beverly, gave me my first actual paid radio position out there. Mm -hmm. And um, one day I, you know, I, I was answering the phone again, just a small shop. So pretty much anybody would answer the phone. Right. And the person on the other end was working at the ABC affiliate there in town, uh, the television station. And uh, randomly, they asked, hey, can anybody out there help us write a commercial? Wow. I was like, I can. And that was the start of my television career. <laughs> wow. Uh, so I went over there and started doing um, uh, television news promos. Okay. And started writing and, uh, and editing and stuff like that. And then they actually let me start voicing uh, some of their commercials and some of their station imaging, which was kind of fun. Nice. And it's not just, uh, I want to mention, because other people have mentioned this too, that in the beginning, especially when you're very young, people have tended to have mentors or people who help them along the way. And it sounds like you had a couple of mentors or people that took a liking to you and like, come on, I'm going to show you the ropes. Um, uh, is that true for you also? Yeah. You know, it's, it's really kind of interesting. Um, I, you know, my senior year of college, uh, was, just gangbusters. It was absolutely nuts. Um, I was going out to the oldies radio station to do the morning sign on traffic and all that kind of stuff. Would come back for a full load of, uh, of classes. I would go over to the ABC affiliate in the afternoons to, you know, write their topicals and, and get all that produced and all that. Then I'd go back out to the radio station to do the afternoon traffic. And then I would come back and try to do my homework and whatnot. I lived in a fraternity house, so that didn't die until about two o'clock in the morning. That was always interesting. And then I was right. DJing dances on the weekend for a, a DJ uh, company. And then I picked up another job at this place called Roland Production Studios. A guy named Tom Roland uh, was the person who owned that. And I basically uh -huh. just went out there and was dubbing tapes <laughs> overnight, just trying to learn how to use all the, uh, you know, the production equipment. The decks, yeah. And there was a great, uh, a great guy uh, named Brent Farwick who was out there. And he taught me a lot about video editing and just theory and, and things like that. And yeah. it's been fun to watch his, uh, you know, career progress as well. Um but yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of mentors uh, throughout the throughout the time. Right, it's been been an interesting uh, in interesting ride. Yeah, it it is, and it's so funny because like like we said earlier, I worked across the hall from you, and I haven't heard these stories. So, I've I've heard other stories about your life and later in life, but not the early stuff. And it's kind of interesting to hear it because it sounds like you had the same kind of work ethic that you have now, where you're doing a lot of things and you're working a lot, but you love it. Uh, I like it. Uh, I think uh, self-preservation is part of it too. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, that's one thing I can say about voiceover and, you know, working in television and all that is it's a fun job to go to. Right. You know, and I think that if you're doing something you don't enjoy, it's tough. I mean, it's really tough, but, you know, it is. it's fun. And I think the thing that I really like about it is that it automatically gives you something in common with other people because when you meet people and you tell them you're in TV, well, we all watch TV, right. we all watch video or, or, you know, we're doing it on different devices yeah. and things now, but it makes it easy to strike up a conversation because people want to know what you do. People are, are curious as to how it works and, yep. you know, voiceover in particular, because, um, people can't believe it's actually a real job. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's one of those jobs that, um, once you get into it and you see the process and how it all kind of comes together, you're, you're like, how is everybody not doing this? This is just amazing. I know. And, and, uh, Bob, uh, your fellow voiceover pro, uh, was saying something similar that what I've said and Mike Thomas have said, it was a director, like, it's kind of like robbing the bank because you, most of the time you come in for free anyway, and you're getting paid to do something that you love to do. <laughs> <laughs> or that's just so, I don't want to say it's easy, but Bob was talking about how, uh, how cushy VO is, you know, you work for an hour a day or something. Well, you go you know, in and, and get And I sushi. can see where he's coming from on that. Bob is an exceptional talent. And, you know, the thing that Bob's not telling you is that there was a lot that went into getting it to where he's just working an hour a day. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, oh, yeah. 
I mean, it's definitely an art. There's, you know, there are people who speak and then there are voice artists. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, and the reason I can tell you that is because most people, when they get into a booth and they start trying to read other people's words, there's something I like to call the burden of the words. Right. And the reason that I say that is because we get in there and when we are talking to people naturally, like I'm talking to you right now, mm-hmm. we don't really think about how we sound when we're saying it. Right. But when you get into a booth and there's somebody on the other side of the glass that's there to pay you a ton of money just to say what they want you to say, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you start to think, oh my God, wait, okay, if I don't say this exactly the way they want it, they're not going to pay me that money that's out there. And I really want that money. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, wait a second, if I don't say this right, I don't get that. And oh God, they're never going to hire me again. And oh, my reputation is going to be trashed and all this kind of stuff. Right, and you right, spill right. that anxiety building. And that's what I call the burden of the words. You know, when I work with students and whatnot, that's what we really, really try to fight because in all honesty, the reason they're hiring you is because you're you. Right. You know, and that's the thing that a lot of people have a lot of trouble with is because they sit there and think with all of these other people that are in this industry and how competitive this is, it's really hard to get people to buy in that they're worthy of doing it. And so they have this feeling that they have to say it right. It's the difference between the way you think it should sound and the way it needs to sound. And that's what we work on. Right. And, and tell me what you think about this. Cause Bob told me an interesting story about Rick Salty. He does the Rick Salty ads, the pharmaceutical ads on TV. And he just thought he was never going to get that job because it's so, so many scientific words and so many complex words and, and it's just a laundry list of stuff. And he was just like, Oh no. But then he went in there and the woman who was the producer said, you know, just say this like, Hey, you know, things happen. And uh, you have this thing, and and this will help you. And uh, so try it out. And and he did it in that way, and he nailed it. And he's he's literally like doing the campaign for several months now. Well, you know, the thing that's important to do is to just kind of get in there and 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 find the way to have the pressure go away. Yeah. You know, the way I look at it is, you know, the job is the marketing and the auditioning. That's the job. The Mm -hmm. result is the gig. And, you know, so the way I look at it is once I get in there and I I know I have the job, the pressure's off. You know, the people on the other side of the glass, they aren't my biggest, you know, they're not trying to pass judgment on me. They're my biggest cheerleaders. And once I realize that, it makes it really easy because it's a whole lot easier to walk into a room full of friends than it is, you know, to walk into a room full of people who are there just to judge you and tell you how terrible you are. Yeah. You know, if you've got the job, you're in. And that takes all the pressure off. Where do we go from there? Well, you know, I started at this point to get some uh, consistent clients. And, um, you know, uh, the whole time, I mean, I I lived in Knoxville uh, for a long time. I ended up moving out to Little Rock, Arkansas. I became the uh, creative services director of their NBC affiliate, KARK, and was there for a couple of years. And still continued to do some of the work uh, for some of my Knoxville clients and some of the other people around the region. Uh, And then I started doing some work with, um, uh, you know, people there in Arkansas and uh, became the voice of the uh, television station and all that kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm. uh, then I ended up coming back to Atlanta or coming back to the southeast to Atlanta is probably what I should say. And um, started working at the NBC affiliate there. And, uh, you know, that's where things kind of started to get interesting because being in the bigger market meant that I was starting to get bigger, you know, it was just a bigger playground. Right. And so, um, you know, different opportunities started to present themselves, but eventually I finally kind of got to the point where I realized I wasn't really doing this in an organized way and I needed, I needed help. And, uh, Hmm. you know, I have to give credit to my wife on this. She's the one who actually, kind of suggested that I take this a little more seriously. Okay. And um, I think without that, you know, partnership and that support, I don't think I ever would have done it quite to the level that I went to. And so I sat down, started making a strategy. And what I realized I needed to do, and I would suggest this to anybody that's even thinking about starting out, is I I started to seek out somebody who could train me. And that that was the biggest thing. I found a guy... um, his name was Terry Daniel. He's out of uh, Minnesota mm-hmm. uh, in the Twin Cities there, specifically Minneapolis. And he and I started working together and he ended up doing my first few demos for me. 
and uh, really, really nice guy. And then I, I, the one thing that uh, Terry really instilled in me was to realize my value. I mean, how did you get to the classes and how did you get to starting Good Pipes VO and all that? With the Good Pipes VO, uh, how I came to that was people just kept telling me, you do, you've got a great voice, you should, you should use that. And you know, the way they would say it is, hey man, you've got a good set of pipes. You know, and so that's where the Good Pipes came from. Um, again, it was, it was funny to realize that the quality of my voice wasn't as important as how well I used my voice. Mm. Um, you know, cause what they're hiring you to do is deliver a message, not just hum. You know? Right. <laughs> so, right. So, uh, that was the big, the big wake up call was realizing that I needed to figure out how to relay the message, not just sound good while I speak. Right. And once I kind of got there, that's when things really started to take off because it's also when I realized that that's when I started sounding like me mm -hmm. and not trying to sound like somebody else or the big voice that just wanted to say everything just so perfectly and so fun. And so, you know, all this stuff It's right. just once I realized that I, you know, I didn't have to open my throat and, you know, talk in the big movie trailer voice and everything that I said, I didn't have to do that. I could just right. speak as me. And people would start to be able to relate to that a little bit more. Right. So you've started Good Pipes VO. Mm -hmm. You have some. So this is initially when it starts out. You have some clients, and how do you how do you build it, and how do you get into classes? You know, the one piece of marketing advice that I give everybody is tell everybody you know that this is what you do. And right. the reason why is because uh, we don't have storefronts. We don't have brick and mortar stores. Mm -mm. You know, we might have a website, but a lot of talents in particular, new talents don't. And so the only reason, the only way that people will know to even think about you is by you saying something about it. And I'm sure you tell them social media too. I mean, that's a good way to get your brand. Social media is huge. Yeah. I've just actually started doing a YouTube channel, uh, where I, I saw I like it. It's talk great. About things. Oh, I appreciate that. I, but it's just, I want to talk about things that not everybody else is talking about. Yes. And so it's called The Good Pipes Point of View. Uh, it's on YouTube. Would love if everybody would go and subscribe to that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I like to look at things from different perspectives. I'm able to bring the video editing and voiceover aspects of, of both industries into one place. And it's amazing to me how much crossover there is. And, you know, I just put out my first video and I'm, I'm really just kind of overwhelmed by the positive response it's, it's received. And I think it's because a lot of people don't take into consideration how other people that, that would be using their voice files actually use it. And it's been, uh, been kind of a, a, a revel revelation for some people. Cool. And, and let me just ask you, because Gene was taught, the actor that I interviewed was talking about the importance of finding an agent that gets you. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like it's really important to find an agent that understands you and what you do and is able to promote you? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting that you, you bring that up because, um, I think what's important is to have an, have agents that are placed around the country that can give you the most exposure. Okay. Uh, by all means, it's it's really, really nice to have that agent that will take the time to get to know you and will send you the jobs they feel are right for you. Right. There are a lot of agents that are out there that will just literally spray. They will put every job out to everybody right. and hope that one of them sticks. Yep. You know, you want to take the time to uh, vet the agents that you're hoping to work with to find out which ones they are and decide if that's if that's right for you. I wanted to ask you one more thing before we get to advice and tips and tricks. Podcasters have these conferences and I know voiceover, you have VO Atlanta and stuff like that. How would you, um, what would you say to people about going to these conferences? Is it beneficial for networking purposes, for learning? Uh, Cause they are kind of pricey, but uh, yay or nay on the conferences? You know, there's a lot of debate about this. I personally am a big fan of some of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I personally really like VO Atlanta. Uh, I think Gerald Griffith puts on a, a fantastic, uh, weekend event there. Uh, I've been going to that one for the past few years and I'll say this, uh, it can be overwhelming. There are a lot of people there, mm -hmm. but 
you get a great um, just understanding of where the industry is currently. You know, a lot of people look at it as, well, I'm not going to go there just to hang out with other voiceover talents. Why, what would I get out of that? Right. Well, it's not just voiceover talents. There are agents there. There are producers there. There are casting directors there. Uh, I have definitely gotten work from that uh, that event. You know, it's not, uh, you know, they make sure to let you know in the in the beginning that you should not expect to go there expecting to get work. But that doesn't mean it can't happen. Cool. Awesome advice, man. So let's let's end up on that. Let's end up on some advice and anything you would say to younger people wanting to get into this industry. Some people might want to take your classes and and even people who are thinking about switching careers. What's your advice? You know, uh, the one thing that I think is interesting, and I talk a lot with my students about this, is to realize that as a voiceover person, we're there to support the other elements in the spot. It's really easy when you get in that booth to feel like you have to make yourself bigger than life because that's what's going to sell the, the, the idea. Well, the idea of selling mm -hmm. is what's the pastime. It's more of a telling of the story, a telling of the message that's going on. And once you can kind of get to that point where you realize that, it makes it a lot easier to just calm down, do what you do. I mean, pay attention to the advertising that's out there these days. It's kind of a flat voice. It's, you know, there's, not right. the, there's not the pitchiness. There's not any of that. It's just, you know, when you start to pay attention to it, the voice is actually a, you know, it is definitely a part of it, but that's just it. It's a part. It's not the whole story. And so I tell mm -hmm. my students to support the other elements, the video, the music, all, you know, the editing that's been chosen for that, as opposed to making it be the other way around. Don't make everything else have to support you. And right. once people kind of start to get that idea, it makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, as far as the, advice, the biggest thing, you know, is just for people to give themselves permission. You know, I know that sounds weird to say, mm -hmm. but it really, really plays into it. There's a lot of people that will get into that booth and they'll feel like, I have to get this right. I have to do this. I have to blah, 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 blah. And they're putting so much pressure on themselves that it just starts right. to make their, their reads sound unrealistic because mm -hmm. they're trying to be something that they're not. But if they can give themselves the permission to realize they were hired because of who they are, you know, what the, what they heard, what the person who was casting the thing heard. You know, they're, they're hearing the real person. They don't have to be right. somebody else. And that's the biggest thing is, you know, people just need to realize that they need to be themselves because who else on this planet can do a better job of that? You yeah. know, so. Right. Very cool. Awesome. So once again, what is the, the website? Uh, the website is goodpipesvo.com. It's goodpipesvo.com. You can go there. You can uh, learn a little bit more about me. You can see some work that I've done in the past, hear my demos. You can sign up for uh, training there. And, uh, you know, um, I've also just started a YouTube channel called, uh, mm -hmm. if you type in goodpipesvo, G-O-O-D-P-I-P-E-S-V-O, uh, mm -hmm. it'll bring up a playlist. I'm starting to build out my videos there. And we're going nice. to just, you know, there's not a lot to it other than me just trying to talk about what's worked for me in this industry. <laughs> right. Right. No, I saw one of them. It's very cool. And then the Atlanta voiceover studio, did you just go to that website? Yeah. The, the, and there's a ton of, uh, of great um, instructors there. Uh, you know, anybody in the Atlanta area and, you know, especially now we're having to do everything virtually, you know, anyone in the country can start coming there and, and, and seeing how it's done the Atlanta way. And, cool. uh, it's, it's been a good thing. Well, awesome, Steve. Great talking to you. Well, I appreciate you having me and this has been a lot of fun. It's always great to talk to you. Sean. Awesome, man. Yeah. Good to talk to you. Thanks for listening to the lights camera pro podcast where entertainment pros talk about how they made their dream into a career. Thanks for listening and subscribe to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. Thanks to Bob Jurgens for the rock and VO and Joseph McDade for the music. Next time we have actress Shel Ramos, who tells us what it's like to work with Al Pacino and Ray Liotta. And she's got lots of other stories about the shows The Purge, The Outer Banks, and so much more. See you next time.